Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this episode, we continue on with the study of Surah Baqarah, verses 11 onwards, where Allah is still explaining to us the case of the munafiq. So in verses 11 onwards, Allah says, When it is said to them, Do not make mischief on the earth, they say we are the only ones that are putting things right. For sure, they are the ones who are making mischief, but they do not realize it. When it is said to them, Believe as the others believe, they say, shall we believe as the fools believe? No, of a surety they are the fools, but they do not know. When they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. But when they are alone with their evil ones, they say, we are really with you. We were just only joking. Allah will throw back their mockery on them and give them rope in their trespasses so they will wander like blind ones. These are the ones who have bartered guidance for error, but their traffic is profitless and they have lost true direction. So the question that we can still ask is, what is the nature of the disease that is spreading in the heart of the munafiq? That is where we ended the previous episode, where Allah was telling us about the heart of the munafiq that has a disease in it. What is the nature of this disease? Well, just like any disease, when a human starts to suffer from an illness, he remains completely unaware of it until he experiences symptoms. That is when he realizes that his body might be suffering from some kind of a disease and that is when he decides to visit a doctor and get treatment. In the very same manner, when the heart of a believer becomes ill, he will exhibit symptoms as well, signaling the need to visit the Quran and get treatment. So that's why you can understand the beauty of Allah using the term disease when he's talking about the heart of a munafiq. But what exactly are these symptoms? Well, firstly, the individual's ego will stop him from ever pointing the finger at himself. This is a kind of person who does not like to be corrected. And if he is politely warned, he becomes extremely defensive. He refuses to accept that his actions are creating confusion and disarray amongst the Muslim ummah. And he will argue that, on the contrary, he's actually establishing peace. He's actually promoting a greater understanding of Islam. And this is what Allah mentions in verse 11. When he is warned to not innovate or alter the interpretation of Allah's commands, he refuses to stop. And he starts to argue that he is on the right path and everyone else is misguided. In fact, as mentioned in verse 13, he refuses to believe as the rest of the ummah believes, considering the Muslims as being fools for following the Sharia and Islamic laws. And he is certain that he is intellectually and spiritually superior to them. This is just an example of one of the symptoms that a person will experience if his heart is suffering from the disease of hypocrisy. So as you can see, Allah is explaining this not so that we can go around judging people, but so that we can critically examine ourselves and ask ourselves, are we exhibiting this behavior? Are we finding it hard to point the finger at ourselves? Are we becoming very defensive if someone warns us politely that we might be wrong? Are we starting to believe that we are better than everyone else? In other words, this problem of being self-righteous. Now, secondly, another symptom that Allah explains here is that as the disease in the heart starts to spread, the individual will lie, he will deceive, he will betray the trust of his loved ones. The same three things that were mentioned in the Hadith that I referred to in the previous session. And this is again all explained in verse 14. So a person like this will profess his sincerity and his true faith to the Muslims. He will promise that he is a true believer and that he has so much love for Allah and the Prophet in his heart, but he will be concealing his support for the enemies. He will appear to be helping the believers, but he will be having secret meetings with the enemies of Islam to divulge information about Muslims and their future plans. So, of course, since he's living amongst the Muslims and he knows exactly what the Muslims are planning, he will behave like them, he will gain information about them, and then he will secretly share that information with the enemies of Islam to help the enemies in their war against the Muslims. So, in doing so, this hypocrite is able to attain the approval of both the Muslims and the non-Muslims. So the Muslims, of course, see him as being someone who is muttaqeen. They see him as being part of the Muslim ummah. And the non-Muslims see him as being part of their side. 
So in doing so, he's able to gain approval from both parties. And this, of course, grants him leverage to side with the party that wins in future battles. In future battles, if Muslims win, then of course he will gain from that. And if in future battles the enemies of Islam, the Jews for instance, win, then he will be able to gain benefit from that. He will be able to remind the Jews that you won because of me. I gave you all the secret information uh, regarding the plans of the Muslims. In fact, a clear example of this behavior can be seen amongst the leader of the hypocrites in Medina at that time, whose name was Abdullah ibn Ubay. During the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Abdullah ibn Ubay used to confess his iman and his belief in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, abiding amongst the Muslims while secretly conspiring with the Jews against Islam. But of course, we could ask, why would a Muslim nowadays bother to agree with other Muslims in public, but secretly go against Muslims in private? What do they stand to gain by portraying the image of being a good Muslim, but secretly going against Islam? Why not just openly go against Islam? The Munafiks in Medina during the time of the Prophet would side with the Muslims because, as I just explained, they had a love for power. They wanted to receive the same benefits as other Muslims. So, of course, they would pretend to be muttaqeen. But at the same time, they feared that power might shift to the Jews in the future. And this would encourage them to secretly befriend the Jews as well. Now, similarly, nowadays, what we have is a love for power, fame, acceptance, likes on social media, followers. This is a need of the Muslim youth nowadays. Publicly, Muslims will say things or dress in a certain way designed to impress the Muslim community so that they can gain popularity, power, fame, but privately they will behave in the exact opposite manner. So again, it goes to show you that it has to do with the love for dunya. When you have so much love for dunya, power, fame, and you want to be accepted and you want validation from society, you will be willing to do anything. So if you have to portray the image of being a Muslim in certain areas, you will do that. And if you have to portray the image of being someone completely opposite when you are sitting amongst other friends, you will do exactly that. You will do whatever it takes to gain as much popularity and fame as you possibly can. Now, once the disease of hypocrisy has clearly saturated and covered the heart, then the monophic becomes summum bukmun umyun, deaf, mute, and blind. His heart cannot be a recipient of Allah's message anymore, and his fate has become sealed because he intentionally chose to be misguided by exchanging guidance for error. In fact, this is the reason that verses 8 to 13 keep emphasizing that such a monophic continues doing wrong but he doesn't realize it. He doesn't know it. He doesn't get it. Having reached the end of his path where he has now no more taqwa, he's completely destroyed his taqwa and his heart is completely covered with the disease of hypocrisy. He simply fails to see or understand where he's going wrong. And that's why he becomes deaf, mute and blind. As mentioned in verse 15, once this stage has been attained, Allah gives him rope, implying that Allah no longer grants him opportunities for him to gain guidance. Instead, the gates of all good things are opened for him. And the idea being that now he can thoroughly enjoy dunya, he can thoroughly enjoy this life. This proves that wealth, assets, fame, popularity, everything linked to dunya can distract insan from the path of Allah. The desire to accumulate, compete, race towards dunya can be so strong that tests and hardships become the only way by which insan can realize the truth, open up his eyes, and again move back towards the path of Islam. That is why I keep saying tests and hardships are not a curse. It's a blessing. It's the only means by which insan can open up his eyes and realize where he's going wrong. So instead, when Allah grants someone rope, in other words, Allah gives them as much of dunya as they want, Allah removes distress and tests and hardships and calamities, He practically makes this dunya jannah for them. He practically removes any hope that a person like that can ever understand the difference between truth and falsehood. Because when you're given so much dunya, you are obviously going to fall in love with that dunya even more. It becomes impossible at that stage to understand Islam, Allah, 
jihad, struggle, things like that just become too difficult for someone. Perhaps, in fact, this is how Allah increases the disease in the heart of the munafiq, as he mentioned in verse 10, which I discussed in a previous session. He grants the munafiq so much wealth and assets and power and fame and dunya that the person falls in love with it even more. And by doing that, he ends up increasing the disease that is there in his heart. So Allah just opens up the gates of all good things. But by indulging in all those things, the munafiq ends up increasing the disease in his heart himself. This is how Allah then reserves that person for the final azab on the day of judgment. Having rejected guidance, such an individual lives his life with a lack of purpose. He's wandering blindly between different goals and he lacks any sense of direction because when you are falling in love with dunya, you will just move towards any direction in which dunya pulls you. So you will do whatever it is that society tells you to do. You will start worshipping all kinds of different people. You will have no sense of direction, no vision, no goal. That is a case of the munafik when he reaches the end of his path of munafkat. Now, furthermore, just as a disease can be contagious and it requires others to protect themselves from the one who is afflicted with the disease, Muslims need to remain vigilant of those who are munafik so that the disease of hypocrisy does not spread. Now, that does not mean that Muslims should boycott those who appear to be munafiks, because of course we know that in Islam, admonishing and warning people is equally important. Not every munafik has become summum bukman umyun. Therefore, while boycotting is not advised, continuously surrounding yourself in the company of munafiks is equally dangerous. And now you can understand the beauty of Allah using the term disease. So just like a disease means you will have symptoms, the symptoms we have discussed, in the same way disease means that it is contagious. So keep away, stay away as much as you can from someone like this. That's what Allah is saying. So when you realize that someone is an extreme monophic in the sense that they are saying things about Islam to confuse people, which are definitely wrong, they are portraying a wrong version of Islam, warn them, admonish them, but do not surround yourself with company like that, Otherwise, that disease will spread to your heart as well. Now, there's an important distinction to be made here between the kafir and the munafik. In the case of the kafir, Allah did not mention a disease in the heart. On the other hand, Allah simply says that when a kafir reaches the end of his path, Allah places a veil over his eyes, ears, and heart. Allah seals his fate and reserves the person for jahannam. But in the case of the munafik, there is mention of disease in the heart. When the munafik reaches the end of his path, Allah grants increase to his disease, allowing his heart to be completely covered up with the disease of hypocrisy. In that situation, he loses his chance to ever understand Islam, he weakens his rule, and he becomes summum bukman umyun. However, Allah is not sealing the faculties of sight and hearing. Allah is not putting a veil over the eyes and the ears and the heart because unlike the kafir, the munafik has already embraced Islam. He was already awarded a clean slate on the day that he became a Muslim. After becoming a Muslim, he gradually developed the disease of hypocrisy and while being conscious of it, he allowed that disease to grow. Eventually, he then reached a stage where Allah allowed his disease to increase and inevitably his own actions caused him to become deaf, mute and blind so that he could never repent or understand Islam. So in the case of the rebellious kafir, it is Allah who seals the fate, stopping that person from ever accepting Islam. Because as I mentioned in the previous session, that if people like Firan who committed so many atrocious crimes, if they were able to just repent in the last minute and go to Jannah, the system would be very unfair. So in that case, Allah does intervene. He seals the eyes and the ears and the heart of someone who is a kafir, who has reached the end of his journey. So he has maximized his level of kufr. But in the case of the munafik, because the munafik has already entered into Islam, now later on, even if he does try and repent, or even if he does try and change, Allah does not have to give him a clean slate. In the case of a kafir, Allah does, because the minute you embrace Islam, you get a clean slate. That is the way Allah works. But in the case of a munafik who has already entered into Islam, 
he will now only be forgiven if he truly has repented and if he has truly changed his ways. That is entirely up to Allah now. So Allah, in the case of the Manafik, doesn't have to jump in, intervene, and seal the eyes and ears and heart. On the contrary, the Munafik ends up sealing his own eyes and ears and heart because he simply refuses to change. He allows the disease of hypocrisy to grow. So in his case, Allah doesn't actually have to do anything. He doesn't have to seal the eyes and the ears and the heart. He simply has to open up the gates of all good things. The Munafik in any case is in love with dunya. He was never in love with, it, with Allah. So as soon as the gates of all good things open, the Munafik by falling in love with dunya allows the disease of hypocrisy to completely engulf his heart. Now after this, the next few verses provide analogies that describe two types of Munafiks. The first kind is the extreme Munafik, whose traits have been mentioned in verses 10 to 16. This is the kind of Munafik who advances in his hypocrisy, despite being given so many opportunities to attain guidance. After years and years of denying the message of God, he enters his final stage of hypocrisy, where he, be, he becomes an open enemy of Islam, and he ends up sealing his own fate. So in verses 17 and 18, Allah says, Their similitude is that of a man who kindled a fire. When it lighted all around him, Allah took away their light and left them in darkness so they could not see. Deaf, mute, and blind, they will not return to the path. Now the analogy in verse 17 shifts between pronouns of he and them suggesting that initially there was one person who kindled a fire, then the resulting blaze produced light all around and removed the darkness for everyone. However, the verse then refers to a group of people for whom the light was taken away, and they were plunged into darkness, but the fire was not extinguished. It still provided light for those who wanted to see. So there is one person, who is starting this fire. The light is for everyone, but for some group of people, Allah takes away their light. So now they are suddenly in darkness. That does not mean the fire has been extinguished. The fire is still there for people who wish to take advantage of its light. But for this group of people, Allah has taken away the light from them. So they are in darkness. Now, what does this mean? Well, Muhammad, peace be upon him, sought guidance. And he became the messenger of God. He was able to bring light to the whole world in the form of revelation. This nur, light, continues to exist for those who wish to benefit from it, but it cannot be seen by the extreme monophics who have destroyed their moral compass, destroyed their taqwa. They are now, they have reached the end of the path of monophkat and they have become spiritually deaf, mute, and blind. Summum, bukmun, umyun. Allah takes away their light by permitting the disease in their hearts to grow, which is something I've just discussed. Now, having reached the end of the path of Manafkat, they are now unable to ever understand the message of God because they've lost their spiritual faculties. Their spiritual eyes can no longer see the signs of Allah. Their spiritual ears can no longer understand the words of Allah. Their qalb can no longer ponder and reflect to understand the, the wisdom of Allah. So Allah has extended them rope, allowing them to continue trespassing, enjoying this dunya, while being unable to see the path of God. There is nothing for them in the Akhirah except Jahannam. Although their death has not yet arrived, and the doors of Tawbah are still open, they cannot repent, because their own actions have caused them to lose their ability to hear and see the signs of Allah, and they are also mute. And what that means is that they can never speak the truth. Because to speak the truth, you have to understand and accept the truth. And these people have reached the end of their path where taqwa has completely been destroyed. They cannot understand the truth. So while being misguided, they truly believe that they are on the right path. They cannot understand that they are way off track from the path of Islam. This is precisely what that entire analogy is about. That the fire, the nur, the light of the Qur'an is still available. That has not been taken away. But for these people in specific, they are in darkness now. They will never be able to take advantage of that light 
because they allowed the disease of hypocrisy to grow. Eventually, Allah extended them rope. In other words, Allah further allowed that disease to grow. And that is what it means by saying Allah plunged them into darkness. Allah took away their light. So Allah allowed that disease to grow and now they can never be able to understand Islam. They have reached the end of their path of munafqat. That's why I call them the extreme munafiks. Now the second kind of munafik is the fearful, terrified munafik who is being described in verses 19 and 20. In this case, the individual has not yet sealed his fate. He is not yet summum bukmun umyun. He still has the ability of attaining guidance provided that he makes the right choices. So in verses 19 and 20, Allah says, or another similitude is that of a rain-laden cloud from the sky. In it are zones of darkness and lightning. They put their fingers in their ears to keep out the stunning thunder while they are in terror of death. But Allah is ever around the rejectors of faith. The lightning all but snatches away their sight. Every time the light helps them, they walk. And when the darkness grows on them, they stand still. And if Allah wanted, he could have taken away their faculty of hearing and sight, for Allah has power over all things. Now, unlike the continuous light that was coming from the fire, as mentioned in verse 17, in this case, the light being mentioned is temporary. It's basically coming from lightning, so it comes and goes. So in this case, light does not symbolize the nur of Quran that came from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Rather, it is analogous to ease, while darkness is analogous to difficulty. So just like ease and difficulty comes and goes, this is a light that comes and goes. So in one case, the light was kindled by a man, symbolizing guidance that came from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. While in this case, the light is coming directly from the sky. So it symbolizes ease and hardship that comes from Allah. But there is also another difference in both kinds of light. In the case of the fire, it is described as being a source of joy and happiness for those surrounding it. Because imagine if you're lost in the forest and it's dark, fire provides you with warmth, light, direction. So it is projected as being something that is great. But in the case of lightning, it is being described as terrifying, sharp, intense, loud, scary. It's snatching away sight, even though it is also providing direction to a person who's lost in the dark. In both cases, it is giving light, whether it is fire or whether it is through lightning. But in one case, it is described as being something beautiful and great. But in the other case, it's described as being terrifying and scary. So why the difference? In the first case, Allah is describing Islam from the perspective of the muttaqin, who will see the light, he will rejoice, take benefit of it, and use it to gain direction. The munafiq will have the light taken away from him so that he cannot benefit from it. In contrast, in the second case, Allah is describing Islam from the perspective of the munafiq, who sees it as something terrifying, loud, scary, fearful, so imagine a person walking in the forest surrounded by darkness. When there is lightning, he is able to see far and wide. The lightning grants him sight. But instead of behaving like a muttaqin who would be happy and thankful to Allah for the fact that he can now see in the darkness, the munafiq remains in fear. He's terrified of what's coming and what's coming after lightning, thunder. So he will walk when there is light, implying that he will tread on the path of Islam when he finds Islam easy. But he will stop when there is darkness, which implies he will stop when he finds Islam difficult, when he finds Allah's commands too hard. Or another interpretation is that he will walk on the path of Islam and he will follow Allah's commands and he will practice all of the rituals when he's experiencing a period of ease. But when he experiences a test or hardship, he stops making any effort in Islam, as if to reveal his anger and displeasure at Allah for sending him a test. But regardless of whether the munafiq is walking or stopping, he is always in fear, suggesting that even when he's walking on the path of Islam, he's doing it unwillingly. He is terrified of death. That's what the verse keeps emphasizing. 
the fact that this is a person who is constantly terrified of death, even when he's walking and when he stopped. In this case, now death can be taken in a literal sense or in a figurative sense. What that means is the believer might be literally fearing death itself. So he's terrified of dying. Or perhaps his love for dunya makes him fear rejection by society if he wishes to walk on the path of Islam. So at times, you know, the fear of losing validation from loved ones can result in extreme anxiety and the feeling of life coming to an end. So at times, you know, we have this feeling that I'm doomed. If society leaves me, I'm doomed. If these people don't give me the validation that I'm seeking, I'm doomed. If I walk on the path of Islam and change myself, I'm dead. So it doesn't mean that you are literally fearing death. It means that figuratively you are so terrified of losing people if you walk on the path of Islam. You're so terrified of being judged that it is as if you feel as if you're going to die. So that could also mean that you have a fear of death. So an individual like this will start to move back and forth from the path of Islam, lacking any sense of direction and exhibiting hypocrisy. In certain gatherings, he will feel comfortable talking about Islam and behaving like a pious Muslim. And in other gatherings, the fear of judgment will make him behave in the exact opposite manner. In fact, sometimes the munafiq lives in fear that Allah's mercy will not come to remove the hardship being faced. And he has this feeling that he's doomed, he's dead. So he's faced a test and he has this fear that I'm dead, Allah will never come to help me. Now this is usually the reaction of Muslims who only practice Islam during periods of ease. During a test or hardship, they leave Islam. They beg others for help. They work hard to please society in the hope that society will be able to remove their hardship. They don't trust Allah and they fear that reliance only on Allah will not be sufficient. But regardless of whether the fear of death is literal or figurative, it is because the heart does not have certainty or trust in Allah that that's the reason that a believer like this fails to gain sukoon and peace. However, since Allah does not mention such people as being summum bukman umyun, this implies that they have not lost their moral compass, yet they have not reached the end of the path of munafqat. Allah could have taken away their faculty of hearing and sight, but he hasn't, implying they still have the ability to change once they learn to control their fears and submit to the will of Allah. The disease of hypocrisy has not yet completely covered their hearts. So that's why I don't call them extreme monophics. I call them the terrified, fearful monophics. Surprisingly, Allah refers to the hypocrites in verse 19 as the rejecters of faith or the kafir, even though we know that Allah is talking about the monophic. Now, this is important to understand. Kufr does not just mean to cover or to hide something. It also means to be ungrateful. The munafiks in these verses are called ungrateful even though they are not yet blind and deaf. Because regardless of how many times Allah has shown them mercy and showered them with blessings, they still live in fear. They still seek validation from people and fear losing them. They still fear future tests and hardships and doubt Allah's ability to help them, forgetting the number of times Allah has already removed their previous hardships. They still fear death while forgetting that Allah is always ready to forgive and accept repentance. So inshallah, we'll stop over here, continue on with the next few verses in the next session, but do take a moment to try and understand and reflect over here and ask yourself, where do you stand? Because these are examples that are being explained in Surah Baqarah, which we all can relate to, to some extent. Assalamu alaikum.